it is uh, time. So I would like to call the August 19th, 2020 Longmont Sustainability Advisory Board meeting to order. Uh, Heather, could we please start with a roll call? Sure. Um, Kate Collardson and Violetta Manu uh, Manukian are unable to join us today, but do we have Cody Flagg? Present. Uh, Charles Musgrave? Present. Jim Metcalf? Present. Um, Adam Reed? Present. And Mary Lynn? Present. Sorry, guys. Um, okay. And for staff members, Annie Noble? I'm here. Francie Jaffe? Here. Tim Ellis? Here. Uh, Atra Nasrat? Here. Danielle Levine? Here. And Heather McIntyre is present. And Polly Christensen, council liaison. All right. Jim, we have Oops. a quorum. We have determined that we have a quorum. All right. So the first order of business is the approval of the minutes of last meeting. Um, I will I will move to approve the uh, minutes from last meeting. I second the motion. Uh, all in favor. And I believe it can only be the people who were here last meeting voting. Is that correct? Heather? Actually, all board members, from oh, my understanding right. oh. from legal, is that all board members are allowed to vote. You can see that I'm a rookie. Um, uh, so uh, all in favor? All right. Um, Any up? I'm, I'm against. Um, okay, I have against? Few, well, I, actually, okay. um, I'm not sure how to work this into the meeting, but there's a few things that were um, that were, weren't represented quite accurately in terms of the things that I had to say about the uh, climate action plan. And okay. rather than going through and making those changes, which seems like it wouldn't be uh, very useful to the city um, or the, the, the folks who represent to do that here, um, I, I guess I just want to ask for procedurally where I would bring up that um, we, we talk about um, how we revisit that plan and um, any revisions and iterations that might be in the works. So the revision of the minutes happens at this portion of the section. So I would just need to know which portions of the minutes you would like to revise. Oh, gosh. Um, okay, uh, let me just pull it up and uh, just say that um, in the section on uh, the section on gray water, uh, there were several, but my main concern there was uh, that um, it's a, I'm concerned about the use of um, resources overall which isn't um, water conservation, but um, the resources that are necessary to reprocess water that could just be used as gray water um, after it's already had one use on site. So, and that's slightly different than what was written. Okay. And um, there was a, another couple. Well, I feel like this is going to take some time that is maybe not as um, useful as we could um, be spending it. And I'd rather um, have a, I guess I'll just bring up in um, other business at, um, a request that we have uh, an update on what the process is going to be for um, a review and revision of the plan rather than going through all of that now, Heather. Okay. Because it's not going to really make much difference. Okay. In terms of the outcome of the plan, if I go through those here. So Holly, Mary, you want to, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jim. I just wanted to make sure. So um, what, what you're, you're suggesting is making sure that um, we have a chance to revisit the plan details yep. that are, that our comments last month weren't our final yep. word. On. Okay. Yeah. And that's slightly different than the fact that some of the things I said weren't fully captured, but it's yes, related yes. in that if we're going to review um, and we're going to set up a review and revision cycle, then I don't want to waste our time and I'll just agree to accept the minutes as written. Okay. Go ahead, Polly. I was going to ask you about procedure on that. Um, 
Sorry, I muted because of the phone. Um, I think it also would be good to have a, um, another discussion about it because we have two new board members and that would be, yes. you know, terrific, so. Okay. Great points. So, can I raise a question or issue? Yeah, Annie. Um, so I just want to alert the Sustainability Advisory Board to the fact that this is going to council on Tuesday, August 25th, and that the um, comments from the Sustainability Advisory Board have been submitted to council. So just so you know. Okay. Do we have a copy of those comments? They are in the minutes. They're in the minutes, okay. So I have a question. I think, I believe that the comments that um, were submitted to council are different from those that are summarized in the minutes. And I so think I that Mary is asking about the um, summarization that I wrote in the minutes rather than the comments that were submitted to council on the Climate Action Task Force um, report. Is that correct, Mary? Um, I haven't seen the ones that were submitted to council. I am specifically talking about the meeting minutes where our, our comments were summarized um, in the meeting minutes that were sent out a few days ago from the last month's board meeting. Okay. As I said, um, any changes I would make would not, if it's already, so, so then the question is, when does our feedback go to council? And August. are you saying that? Okay. August 25th. Okay. But that has already been submitted to council. And um, I just, a point of, Clarification, I thought during the last meeting that the minutes, that Francie took the minutes, the notes, um, as you were providing them and had them on the screen. Is that correct or not? Um, I wasn't able to um, read everything that was written on the screen as we went through one of the uh, limitations of having a small laptop, I guess. <laughs> but it's it gets beside the point. I think that if we're going to revisit the plan, we can move on from this point. Okay. Okay. Polly? Um, Mary, I think it would be useful if you, um, if you feel strongly about something, send um, Dawn Quintana, the, the uh, city clerk, um, a message to be distributed to all of city council or. Okay. Or, yeah, just send it to all of city council. Get a note of that. With Thank your you. concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you, Polly. Always learning procedure here. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we could probably send the actual final version that was sent to city council. We could send out after this meeting. I would like to see that. Thank you. Yeah, I think that'd be very good to see and to have as an archive. Yeah, I think that actually would be um, more efficient to respond to that than to the meeting minutes, which were sort of an interim, it sounds like. So the meeting minutes are actually the official record of the Sustainability Advisory Board and was meant only to summarize the conversation of the Climate Action Task Force presentation and all of the votes that you all did. Um, so if there's something that you feel in the minutes is not representing you accurately, then um, I don't know how you want to revise the minutes, but any comments that need to go to Council regarding the Climate Action Task Force uh, report I believe would need to be do, done separately. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is that okay, Mary? Are you fine yeah, with? I'm okay. fine. We have a procedure to go forward. Great. Okay. Great question. So can we um, redo that vote? Because I'm confused. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, mo I move to approve the minutes uh, from last, uh, from the July meeting. And then we had a second from Cody. Cody, do you still second that motion? I second the motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. All right. Great. And then, um, Mary, just for the notes for next month, I will put in there that you had a question about comments that were submitted as part of the Climate Action Task Force recommendations uh, report and that you were going to submit those comments to council uh, later on. And it was Ms. Quintana, what's her first name? Dawn, D-A-W-N. Quintana. Okay. Thank you. And You're is welcome. that, and that would be Dawn. I'll just find her email on the website. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Great. Uh, next order of business is public being invited to be heard. So I'd like to open it up for the public uh, invited to be heard. Uh, so as a reminder, just each person wishing to speak will be unmuted by Heather to speak one at a time. When it's your turn to speak, please state your name and address of record. After you do that, I'm going to start a three minute timer. So let's uh, try to stick to that three minutes and I will uh, let you know when, uh, when that three minutes has elapsed or you might even just hear it. Um, so Heather. All right, we're going to start with Doe Kelly. I'm not hearing anything. Doe, are you there? Unmute. Oh. You unmuted yourself for a second. There you go. Am I, am I on? Yes, you yes. are. Go ahead okay. and state your oh. name and address for the record, please. Yes, and um, Heather, um, I just received notification from Scott Cunningham that he had not received an, um, the link to get on this call and he has public comments to be heard. Can somebody take care of that? Um, yes, I will take care of that. Okay, wonderful. Okay, let me get my script. Okay. Um, my name is Doe Kelly, and I live at 622 Barberry Drive, Longmont. Hello. Am I going? Uh, I will start the timer now. Okay. I spoke to you earlier this year, right before the lockdown. I gave my opinion that this committee should do a study session on 5G, like the one held last year by City Council in Boulder. I encouraged you to deeply study the smart meter issue before approving any rollout. I invited you to have Tim Shekely, PhD, an internationally recognized and sought after expert on wired and wireless communications who lives in our midst to come and speak to this group. And then we were all told, stay home. Today, you hopefully have before you a paper written by Tim called Emma is Here. I believe Tim holds an amazing key that fits perfectly with Longmont's plan for 100% energy renewability called EMMA. EMMA stands for Energy Management and Metering Architecture. It is based in solar energy and battery storage with embedded software technology that performs metering functions. EMMA does not require wireless smart meters. Instead, it's based in fiber to the premises an infrastructure Longmont already has. Wireless smart meters have a wide range of problems, both in terms of sustainability, as well as security, privacy, human health, longevity, and obsolescence compared with analog technology, including fiber. But this committee is concerned with energy usage and the city with things financial. Tim has handed us something amazing, if we are open to it. I implore you to call him in for a presentation or a meeting, ask lots of questions, get the information you need to make a fully informed decision on this topic from an expert who's been in on the development of this entire field of technology from the beginning. Longmont can again take international leadership in the field of sustainability and innovation through wise, wired choices. As a Longmont resident, I task you, the committee providing advice to Longmont City Council on this, to read the Emma paper, see that, that, that it is in the public interest to explore it, and then set up a meeting with Tim ASAP. Now I have a question. Will the city of Longmont be fully insured against health-related or other liability claims, such as fires started by smart meters, should we roll out AMI here? We, the residents of Longmont, deserve to know if our taxes will pay for liability claims from the use of a soon-to-be obsolete technology, according to Tim, that, to my knowledge, insurer, insurance carriers will not insure. And a quote from the website of Dr. Deborah Davis, PhD, which was recorded in 2017 by the SEC, even ITRON, a manufacturer of smart meters, warns shareholders that, we may face adverse publicity, consumer or political opposition or liability associated with our products. 
we may be subject to claims that there are adverse health effects from the radio frequencies utilized in connection with our products. If these claims prevail, our customers could suspend implementation or purchase substitute products, which could cause a loss of sales from the SEC in 2017. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Next, I'm going to unmute Amber Hess, if you would like to speak. Amber, you should like have still muted. Looks like she's still muted. Yeah. I'm working on it. Amber, you should have a pop-up window that is asking you to unmute. And if you press your space bar, you should be able to unmute yourself and talk that way. Okay. Uh, let's move on to Judith Blackburn. This is Judith. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Yes. Uh, I had requested to listen in on this meeting, but not to speak. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judith. Uh, let's go to um, Tim Skelly. That's Sheckley. Sheckley, sorry. No, I didn't. <clears throat> I didn't have any comments to make. I just circulated a paper for you to read. Uh, the Emma paper was mentioned earlier. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Letting in Scott um, Cunningham to the meeting and Doe indicated that he had something that he would like to share. Virginia, did you have something that you would like to say today? No, I also wanted to listen, but I do not have public comments to make today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Scott Cunningham, we have you unmuted. Can you hear me okay? We can, yes. and I'm actually going to shut off your video so that we have the same oh. access for all participants. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, greetings, um, advisory board and other stakeholders. Thank you for this opportunity to address the board. We're here to add to the ongoing discussion about the sustainability of certain proposed additions to Longmont's excellent telecommunications infrastructure. We propose to demonstrate that utilization of wired smart meters to, com to complete Longmont's vision of a smart city provides several distinct advantages over the proposed use of AMI wireless smart meters. As a review, I wanted to mention that the AMI smart meters use a radio frequency waveform to communicate, and it's the same uh, 2.45 rad uh, gigahertz radio frequency waveform used by the microwave oven on your kitchen counter. By the way, do I need to identify who I am or, or I'm a, a good? Uh, please go ahead and state your name and address for the record. Sure. Scott Cunningham. I uh, reside at 3771 South Narcissus Way, Denver 80237. All right, so and herein lies the rub. In the case of the wireless AMI smart meter, those microwaves are broadcast through the surrounding air, whereas in the case of the wired smart meters, all of that radio frequency energy, which contains all of our sensitive personal information, is contained within the ethernet wires. As you can imagine, open wireless systems, such as AMI, represent an enormous, enormous potential for widespread security breaches. In addition, since the microwaves in a wireless smart meter system like AMI are propagating through the air, 
not only is the energy consumption several orders of magnitude greater than with a wired system, which is a major hallmark of unsustainability, the speed of internet access is also much slower compared to wired smart meter systems. As a result of these and many other factors, the cost of both implementation and maintenance for the more efficient wired smart meter system actually hits the pocketbook of your constituents much less than the less efficient AMI system. So I'll leave you with this. Next light is the best fiber optic system in the world. Now is the time for decision makers in, in your forward thinking city to make the next choice that will keep Longmont on the cutting edge with ultra fast fiber optic connectivity rather than hearkening back to the earlier era of slower and much less sustainable uh, wireless facilities. If the board requires further direction into this important project, we suggest that the board utilize an internationally recognized authority on emerging safe, high-performance connectivity, such as Colorado's own Dr. Tim Shackley. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. And I'm going to unmute um, Monty Whaley, if you have something you would like to share. Looks like we're having the same not unmuting problem yeah. that Amber experienced. Okay. Um, I do have several other comments that were also submitted for um, to be read into the uh, to the record. So I'll go ahead and do that now if you're ready, Jim. I am. Yeah. I mean, uh, I actually would we mind trying Amber one more time and sure. just to see if we can we get the that. unmute going. Let's see. Okay. Um, and I guess I would, I would encourage if people are having a hard time unmuting that submitting uh, written statements so they can be read into the record is another option to make sure that their voices get heard uh, by the board. James, uh, just a point of order. Um, can that be done in this meeting and then they can be read in a second public comment to be heard? What, how, what are you suggesting? I, I, uh, I will ask Heather. Um, that I don't know. Procedurally, we only have one public invited to be heard, so I think we could read them at the next um, board meeting. Polly, do you have any clarification on that? Well, yeah. I mean, this board, most of our boards, I think, only have one public comment meeting. The City Council has one at the beginning and one at the end, so yeah, it's so difficult with, <laughs> with Zoom because, you know, we're all having trouble with all our sure. various okay. And I do want to let all the board members know that I was in communication with all of the people from the community who are on this call and asked them if they wanted to speak to let me know. Um, I did not hear back from all of them except for the ones who did say that um, shared their comments and then also a few who were unable to join the meeting today. So perhaps the two people who did not un unmute themselves when I prompted them to do so um, did not have anything that they wanted to share. Okay. Well, I would encourage if they did for them to submit written comments that we can read in the next meeting then. Sure. Okay. Um, the first one that we have is from Dr. Nancy Vandover and she is from Durango, Colorado. She says, Dear SAB members, although I'm not currently a Longmont resident, I do have friends in the area and I work at the state level to raise awareness about EMS electromagnetic sensitivity. Today I'm writing to ask the board not to recommend the installation of AMI meters in Longmont. In the developed world, one third of the population is now having symptoms from wireless radiation and 6% are disabled. This comes from the WHO and other sources. I'm a medical practitioner with EMS patients and am now EMS disabled myself. After learning about our ADA and Fair Housing Act rights, I found out that most people, including the Title II and III entities who are supposed to accommodate the disabled, don't know about or understand EMS. 
It is extremely important that people who make policies that affect our health and lives learn about it and take their responsibility to protect our rights and public access into account. We've been in an invisible class discriminated against to the point where we can't even access our most critical services like a hospital, ER, dentist, or eye doctor. In order to be EMS safe, you need to be able to turn off wireless radiation. In your minutes, I read, quote, the city of Longmont does a good job of adopting and implementing the most recent building codes, end quote. I hope that means that you have adopted the 2005 Federal Access Board's guidelines for the EMS disabled. If you have not added those guidelines, please consider doing it soon. You also say you are concerned about additional cost burdens. Retrofitting for the ADA costs more than it does um, doing it from the start. The financial burden for an EMS disabled person to mitigate their home from a wireless radiation is tremendous. Many can't do it. There are millions of EMS refugees in the world, including Colorado. Our Fair Housing Act's rights have been violated and we need our leaders to stand up for us so that we can simply live safely in our homes. Longmont is an award-winning city because of your fiber to the premises option. I am trying to convince my own rural electric cooperative to follow your example so we can have safe broadband wired electric meters and be ready <clears throat> for our future with a solar microgrid system. Why would you wanna go with an inferior AMI meter system when you can go with, that, with fiber? I've studied Dr. Timothy uh, Sheckley's work. You have an international expert living in Boulder who can help me help you meet your sustainability goals. Wireless uses 10 times the energy of wired. It is not green. Whether it is for broadband or electrical meters, the only way not to violate the federally protected rights of the EMS disabled is through wired connections. I urge you to do, go in that direction to use the great infrastructure you have already created. Thank you, Dr. Nancy Van Vandover, Durango, Colorado. Okay. The next one is from Kimberly Edmondson from 814 Bittersweet Lane, Longmont, Colorado. Sustainability Advisory Board, my name is Kimberly Edmondson. Currently, I am a stay-at-home mom to two twin five-year-olds. Previously, I ran my own massage business in town and before that worked as an x-ray tech for 20 years. I am very strongly opposed to the idea of having smart meters installed in our town. Having studied radiation physics a bit as part of my training to become an x-ray tech, there were some lessons you don't forget. The concept of ALARA, as low as reasonably achievable, meaning do your best to avoid repeats and using the least amount of radiation possible. Since no one knows how little radiation it takes to create a biological effect to a cell or the cellular DNA. Another takeaway is how much more sensitive children are to radiation exposure, exposure with the rapidly dividing cells. I know x-rays and RF EMF radiation are not the same, but still they are all capable of causing damage. I am also one of those people who are sensitive to all of this Wi-Fi radiation as it is already without smart, smart meters and 5G going full bore. I have constant ringing in my ears and I have found that by turning off our Wi-Fi router at night, it stops for a while. If I use my cell phone, iPad, or computer heavily, I have numbness and tingling in my hands. Through my personal health journey and tons of self-study, I found out I am deficient in B vitamins, an effect of EMF radiation. They deplete B vitamins. Despite having a healthy diet, not being overweight, and exercising regularly, my A1C levels suggest I am pre-diabetic. There are studies that show EMF radiation causes diabetes, and she gave two links here, which I'll forward to you after the meeting. She goes on, my husband suffers from many of the symptoms that are listed side effects of EMF radiation, many listed in the above study, but refuses to make the connection being a person who works on computers all day. I stopped having brief episodes of atrial fibrillation since we started shutting down the Wi-Fi at night. My problem is that with the smart meter, I will not be able to shut it off. I won't be able to shut off my neighbors either that is pointing toward the side of my house. I will be regularly bombarded everywhere I go. If my body of around 130 pounds is this strongly affected, what will it do to smaller beings, children, dogs, cats, birds, bees, insects, and plants? What will be the long-term effect of these other creatures who cannot show up today to speak? Lastly, I suggest that all of you watch the Smart Meter documentary put out by Josh Del Sol. They also discuss how these meters use more electricity to operate and often cause higher utility bills for the residents. 
or the guy whose pacemaker was having issues after his was installed. This should be optional and not mandatory with no penalty for opting out. Seriously, please watch this, each and every one of you. The health of the planet depends on it, and she gives a YouTube link. If you want to learn more, call. I will be happy to share information from the transcripts from the recent 5G summit or arrange a time for those interested in watching what these experts in this field have to say. In summary, it is not good for human health or the health of all living things. Kimberly Edmondson. And I will forward that email with the links and everything in it for you. Thank you. The next one is from Jessica Davis, whose address is 2221 Longs Peak Avenue, Longmont, Colorado. She says, I am a hospice nurse and have serious concerns about the negative health effects from the electromagnetic magnetic radiation that these meters emit. There are numerous studies that have shown that exposure to this radiation can cause brain cancer, heart palpitations, insomnia, anxiety, headaches, and overall degradation to human cells. I would strongly encourage city council to allow families to have the option for the installation of a smart meter on their house. It is our right to be safe from harmful de devices and the smart meter certainly is very harmful. I do not want such a meter anywhere near my children as I firmly believe it negatively impacts their health. Thank you for sharing my concerns at the 3.30 meeting today. And one more from Becky Nelson, although I do not have an address for her. She said, I believe smart meters are not the way to achieve sustainability and that there are other more sustainable means in the works. There are many arguments that the meters are unhealthy and the smart meters works against the vision and mission of a committee with a goal of 100% um, energy sustainability. This technology seemingly may create the kind of polarization we are looking not to create in the interests of powers that would seek to expand before obtaining relevant knowledge on the subject. I implore you to help us all redirect the current plan and thinking on the smart meter rollout. Thank you for your time, Becky. And then I also did receive the comments that um, Tim uh, Schelke um, referred to, so I will pass those along to the board as well. And that's all I have. Thank you, Heather. Uh, okay, uh, next, uh, agenda revisions and submission of documents. Uh, I'm uh, staff, city staff, is there anything that you would like to bring up? I don't know of any, Annie, do you? I don't know of any, nope. Okay. All right, I will take that as a no and uh, move on to general business. Um, so uh, just before we move on to the general business, we have three different topics that we're going to uh, uh, have today. Um, I've been asked to make sure that we reserve our comments until the end of the presentation, just for time's sake. So um, I will take notes and my own comments, and then um, uh, when each person is done, uh, we can ask whatever questions that we have, if that, if that sounds okay to everybody. Great. Uh, well, first on our list is uh, Francie Jaffe, who's going to be talking about our greenhouse gas inventory. Um, hi, my name is Francie Jaffe. I'm the Water Conservation and Sustainability Specialist. Um, today, I am going to give an update on the 2019 greenhouse gas inventory. Next slide. Um, I'm going to go over kind of how this ties in with our sustainability direction, the methodology we use for our greenhouse gas inventory report, and then I'm going to go through key findings and implications. Um, I am actually, um, if it's all right with the board, I'm going to pause twice for questions, once after the inventory methodology and once after key findings, um, since I thought there might be different types of questions after each. I will allow it. Great. Thank you. Next slide. So the um, sustainability plan calls for the creation of a 2016 greenhouse gas inventory baseline, which we completed in 2018. Uh, we are now, and then it called for the, for the uh, inventory to be updated every three years, and we did the 2019 update this year, with the overall goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 66% by 2030. Next slide. We use the Global Protocols for Community Scale Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventories, or the GBC Protocol, which was developed in 2014 by the World Resources Institute, ICLE, 
um, the Local Governments for Sustainability and C40, Cities um, Climate Leadership Group. Uh, they have different types of protocols. We use the basic plus, which is their more expen expansive protocol that covers all scopes that I'll go into the next couple of slides. And um, the units that are used are metric tons of um, carbon dioxide equivalent or CO2 equivalent, which combines emissions from three greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxides. Next slide. Just for context, one metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent is the equivalent of about 2,500 miles driven, 113 gallons of gasoline, or about 10% of your home's energy usage for one year, just to give you a little bit of a visual. Next slide. So there are three different scopes um, that make up the GBC protocol. The first scope is what's within your defined boundary. We define our boundary as the city of Longmont boundary, but we do include a piece of agricultural land that we do have um, about eight cattle on just outside the city um, so that we include it in the, within the inventory. This covers the different sectors of agriculture, forestry and land use, industrial processes, uh, fuel consumption from stationary uh, buildings, so that's mostly buildings, um, inboundary waste and inboundary transportation. We also include scope two, which is um, emissions that may have been generated elsewhere but are used in long run, so that's grid supplied energy. And then scope three, which is out of boundary waste and wastewater, transmission and distribution and out of boundary transportation. Uh, that is primarily a, a portion of our transportation of essentially Longmont residents using the Denver airport. Next slide. So those, the different ones I walked into within the scopes are different sectors um, that we use. I'll be using um, throughout the slides IPPU for industrial processes and product use and AFOLU for agriculture, forestry and other land uses. Next slide. And to um, build out the sources, um, sources go into much more depth on buildings and transportation. Buildings, we look at residential versus commercial, as well as by fuel type, as well as, and fugitive emissions and transmission and distributed, distribution losses. For transportation, we also look by, look by fuel type. We also build, um, separate out transit um, from our local bus systems, railways, electric vehicles, and then transboundary aviation, so that's the portion from Denver, versus inbound aviation, which is the portion from our Longmont Airport. Next slide. So we added an information only item. I'm, I, I'm calling it an information only item because this is not part of the greenhouse, uh, the GPC protocol. Essentially, we are a, we own 26.1% of Platte River Power Authority and that is called our equity share. So of total Platte River Power Authority emissions, which are about 3 million metric tons, we have about 790, 917 metric tons. That's combined with both what we use on the electric grid and what um, Platte River Power Authority is selling on the market. So they sell a portion of their electricity, not to the four owners, but on the market. So normally in our greenhouse gas and, um, study, we only look at what Longmont is using. And that doesn't actually include our portion of what they're selling to the market. So we're referring to this as our additional equity share which is about 260 metric tons um, carbon dioxide equivalent. So this will be shown in one of the, the uh, key findings as a informational only, just to kind of show the impact of the, our ownership of Platte River Power Authority on a broader scale. So I'm gonna stop here. Um, does anyone have any questions on the methodology? Adam? Thank you. I have a question about scope three, the out of boundary transportation. Does that include non CO2 sources, such as the contrails emitted by airplanes, for instance? Uh, we, I, I would have to look into that. Um, my understanding for transboundary aviation is that we use a estimation that is developed by the Denver airport and they assign up, there's essentially a percentage you can use for different communities. Um, I would have to dive into the data to figure out exactly how that's being calculated and I can get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. 
Charles? I, I had one question. For the equivalent CO2 emissions, I think you lumped uh, CO2, methane, and NO2 together. Um, is, there's no weighting that takes into account the different global warming potentials of the gases? Yes, sorry, I did not add the weighting in that. We do factor in the weighting when converting to CO2 um, equivalent. Um, so it, I can actually pull that up. I believe it's 16 for methane, but let me, that one I find very quickly. So the conversion um, for the global warming potential, sorry, those, it's 28 for methane. So you multiply it by 28 and then 265 for nitrous oxides. So we are factoring in those. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? Awesome. Great, um, next slide. So now I'm gonna walk through the key findings starting on the next slide. So these are the two, uh, 29 emissions by sector. On the next slide, I'll show it with the equity share, but I'll walk through this first. About 80% of our emissions come from commercial and industrial buildings and residential buildings, which is so it's our largest use of emissions from both electricity and natural gas. And then after that, uh, transportation is about 19%. On the next slide, if we factor in that additional equity share, we see that is 21%. Um, so is so adjust the other percentages um, accordingly, but this really highlights the importance of our commitment to 100% renewable energy by 2030, as it will not only have an impact on our buildings, but on our emissions in, from what Platte River Power Authority is selling to other communities. Next slide. Um, so this slide, um, this, pre this graph breaks it out um, by residential in commercial electricity and natural gas. So for electricity, our total, uh, that is our largest emissions. So that's about 53% come from both residential and commercial electricity. After that, we have 24% from natural gas. And then transportation, we broke out the aviation to, for, to focus on on-road transportation and transit, which is about 16%, kind of highlighting the key different areas of focus that we should uh, work on to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. We had a number of information only um, besides the additional equity share. Essentially, the GBC protocol does not allow for the subtraction of avoided emissions, um, but we calculated it just to see um, how much emissions we're avoiding from recycling, as well as community-generated renewable energy use. Um, the total is about 88 um, 1,181 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, most of that coming from recycling efforts. We also did a separate effort this year to conduct a waste life cycle analysis. Um, these numbers are not included um, in this graph and in this report. We will actually be coming back to the board in a, at a future meeting to walk through the waste life cycle analysis report as well as when we have an overview of current waste services programs. Next slide. So in comparison, comparing 2016 to 2019, uh, we overall had a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. You can see that broken out by sector on the right. Um, this is not just due to activity, but improved methodology. So for activity, we saw an increase in waste diversion. Um, our carbon intensity of our electricity mixed um, decreased, which had an impact, as well as uh, multiple oil and gas wells were closed in Longmont. Um, air tra travel, if you see on the graph, has a significant decrease, and that's mostly due to improved methodology. Estimating greenhouse gas emissions is a constantly um, evolving field, and every year they're figuring out more and more ways to do it that are more accurate. So as we do these um, updated inventories, we're going to keep updating the methodology so that we can have the most accurate emissions summary. So that was one of the ones we saw that was an air, from airport specifically in estimating our emissions in relation to the Denver airport. Uh, next slide. So in terms of implications, uh, our greatest opportunity is to continue the transition to 100% renewable powered electricity. Um, as this 
inventory, our, our mix was about 30% renewable energy. And since this inventory has completed, we are now at 50% renewable energy. This also highlighted the need to focus on buildings, not only transitioning to 100% renewable powered energy for electricity, but improving energy efficiency. And then after that, work on transportation. And we will also be coming to the board at a future meeting to discuss the equitable non-carbon transportation roadmap um, that staff have been working on through sustainability tax funding this year to detail how we can meet the goals um, detailed in the transportation section of our sustainability plan and envision long not. And with that, thank you all. And um, are there any other questions? Holly. Okay. There we go. Um, thank you, Francie. That was really a great presentation. I, I, um, I would like it if you could send that to the city council, uh, if that's possible. Although your explanation of all of it is kind of essential. Um, one specific question though I had is, <clears throat> as we <clears throat> try to, <clears throat> sorry, um, as we try to tighten up buildings to make them more energy efficient, um, we're also coming into problems with um, <clears throat> sick buildings, you know what I mean, um, in that there isn't as much ventilation and therefore <clears throat> people um, are getting sick because things are not being ventilated as much as they used to be. Uh, my house is basically a tent, but <laughs> it was built in 1941. Um, so are we thinking about um, the cost of increasing ventilation systems and the additional cost that the additional uh, energy that's going to consume to increase ventilation to make up for the fact that we have uh, tightened up the building envelope so that it's uh, more energy efficient. Did I make that? Did I? Yep, that was clear. very clear. I also wanted to highlight before I answer your question um, that we will be bringing both the greenhouse gas inventory and the carbon free uh, transportation plan at the same time to city council. So I will be. Oh, you're going to bring it. Okay. And when are you going to, when are you going to do that? Um, I believe we have a tentative date in October, but we're still okay. in the roadmap. Um, but okay. I, um, Annie Noble, when she presents the Climate Action Task Force, will touch a will highlight some of the results of this inventory and not go into into it in depth. But City Council will at least have that okay. as a when reviewing the yeah, then, recommendations report. Okay, just wait because yeah, we will get it all at once. But that's that's really an excellent um, presentation, and I found the uh, the also the report that we got. Um, that was about 40 pages long. That was also um, an excellent report. So thank you very much for uh, all you're doing. Good job. Thank you. And then to answer your other question, uh, yes, ventilation is, uh, is essential if you're tightening up buildings. Um, I do not believe... Um, I, I don't know if we have done an extensive study on the costs of retrofitting buildings um, at this time, to my knowledge. Yeah. Um, I, I do believe that that should be factored in. And, I, I, and my understanding for, is that it would be factored in when you update a building envelope, you need to update um, the, the ventilation, but I see Tim just clicked on his camera, so he can have a better answer for you. Well, I have a, another answer, <laughs> and I don't know if it's better, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, if you tighten up a building, that, that can cause some significant health problems. Um, yeah. If whoever is tightening your building does not also do an assessment on how to properly ventilate the, the dwelling yeah. or the business, what they're supposed to do is to come up with a ventilation plan because really the bottom line is it's all about c controlled versus uncontrolled ventilation. In a leaky building, yeah. it's uncontrolled and you're losing heat and air conditioning and you, you can't stop it. If you have a controlled ventilation, you still get 
actually better health benefits if it's properly set up because it ventilates it correctly and in the areas it needs to, in the volumes it needs to, because it can be calculated uh, to, to have a certain amount of air turnovers per hour. And uh, it should be a healthier building if it's done right. But that's yeah. you know part of what a contractor has to figure out if, if they're doing seal air sealing and insulation, they also have to take into account the ventilation that, um, impacts that are going to occur. Hope that, right. uh, that help, I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Francie, I, I had a question. Um, uh, do we do we know like of the so of reducing CO two equivalent, let's say, of buildings? There's some part of it that is reducing the CO two production or CO two equivalent production of the energy that goes into the building, and then there's another part that's making the buildings more energy efficient. Do what is the mix of that? Like, how much can we actually gain by making the buildings more efficient, and how much is actually going to really be dependent upon us getting the our energy sources to that 100% renewable. So we do have a modeling uh, spreadsheet. So I'm going to pull that up now, see if I can give you a quick answer. Um, from transitioning to 100% renewable is really what's gonna get you the significant savings. Um, that's really when you start to see those uh, large drops um, in usage is when you get closer to 100%. I'm not sure at what's the specific percentage where you start to mm -hmm. see, is it 75? I don't know where between okay. in 100 it is or 30 in 100. Um, the, with um, having, uh, you can, sorry, I, I probably would be best if I looked at this and then got back to you. Sure. That'd be great. Look at the same time, um, you can definitely the you'll make a, more, a building more efficient. But if you have a you'll you'll lose some of your savings because you're having the electricity coming in that's not um, as a carbon intensive. Um, so if if we kept the same kind of carbon intensity, and increased the mm -hmm. you'd see more savings than when if we're not. Uh, but it it definitely is a contribution, and I can get back to you on specific percentages. That'd be great. That'd be great. Thank you, um, well, so Adam. Just, you had your hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Tim. Yeah, I just wanted to give a, just a broader perspective on that. I think our you know our city goal is around one percent per year energy efficiency, and if you think about one percent per year going up to 2030, we're saving that much energy on our building okay. usage, um, and then we'll have to come up with the renewable energy to offset the rest. So basically, so it's going to be, as Francie said, it's, it's mainly driven by the renewable energy um, that the carbon reductions are going to come from. But we're, you know, we really want to make it more efficient because that saves everybody money and um, it's overall better. Even if you have 100 percent renewable, you still want to drive energy efficiency to, uh, to, to keep the costs minimized as possible. Yeah, there's a lot of great co-benefits to right. energy efficiency. Adam, you had a question? Yes, thanks Francie for the presentation. I had a question related to uh, buildings and that is um, apart from their energy efficiency, um, does the methodology include how much, uh, how, many, how much emissions are generated with new builds? Like if you're building a new development? Uh, that wasn't included in our inventory since I was just looking at 2019. That was included in our modeling document. And in our modeling document, uh, we also looked at um, we also looked at projections of if we created kind of like a net zero new building development and the impact of that, as well as the electrification of new buildings, um, when kind of seen for to help with strategy selection moving forward, and again. Um, so but the one thing I do have to say about new buildings is it's such a small percentage that you really start when looking at electrification or new code, it definitely helps. But if we're looking at the overall um, impact of, of our buildings going forward, the new buildings are gonna, are, are, are gonna be a, a smaller percentage compared to how many buildings already exist. And then if you, so, you might not see it as 
new buildings, um, it's really important to make them efficient from the onset because it's more expensive to retrofit, but you're not going to see as drastic savings of, let's say, making sure all new buildings are really energy efficient and all electric than if you were going to like retrofit like a, a large portion of our current buildings. And Mary. Um, yeah, I just responding to Polly's question about sick buildings. Um, this is just general information. Uh, here in Boulder County, we're kind of a center for the um, building biology movement. And there's uh, quite a few different practitioners uh, in the Boulder area who will um, come and measure the levels of the volatile organic compounds in your home. Your um, Obviously, there's um, other folks who will uh, measure the, um, the radon. Um, the um, uh, CO2, of course, um, you have to have meters installed, I believe, um, as part of code now. Um, I'm not sure um, on your on your um, water heaters um, and you know your your gas um, um, heaters. But um, I just wanted to um, make that information sort of put that information out there, and that I can imagine that there's a savings over time with having building biology components. Uh, com included, like for example, if you need to have the perforated pipe underneath the slab prior to, um, you know, as you're building the house rather than going in and doing these retrofits later. So I don't know if we're there in a, that's sort of a comprehensive look at um, buildings. It's not um, in building code. It's not just the carbon piece. And I'm wondering if there's any place in the city government where that kind of a comprehensive look is taken at any sector, um, sort of looking at different um, aspects like that, um, or if that's something that might be uh, interesting to consider in looking at new building, is uh, including a building biology component. I, I do know, I don't know, I, I'm not very familiar with the um, S, SES tool, Sustainability Evaluation System. Um, but I know that was has been in the practice of being development for in development for certain development projects and is trying to do a certain whole kind of holistic approach for those of evaluating those. Um, I don't know how much those I think it's more for the impact of the development on the it's the the local area than the um, the building itself. Um, but we do have a plan for updating our building codes in probably the next year or so. Um, so that, that would be an opportunity to speak more on the, the building biology that you were talking about. Is there any place in the city where, sorry to just finish my question, where we could create a program where maybe there would be um, an EMF meter, a VOC meter, um, the radar um, meter, you can borrow that from the city. Um, where homeowners could sort of borrow these and, and do some self-assessment and get some help with retrofit? Uh, I'm going to call on, let's see, Tim, you're the first one, but then both Polly and Annie were responding to that one directly. So I don't, just, how about we do uh, Tim, Tim, Annie, Polly, and then we're going to have to move on to the next one. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just be quick. Um, so the building codes in general have um, a guideline on air changes per hour that is supposed to address issues like that. But as, as homes, you're right, as homes become tighter, there are other um, emissions that are, are useful to, right. to really take a look at, like radon and, and yes, things that are yeah. local, specific, and important that uh, should be taken into consideration. But really, the, the building codes, the building codes are, are the area that usually um, guide, gives guidance on that, those issues. Thanks, Tim. Annie, did you? Oh, I just wanted to point out that um, we have radon detectors and CO2 detectors at the library that are right, available for that. checkout. And um, we've recently purchased quite a few more. So I know that I've checked them out and they're pretty easily available now. Annie, um, we got a really good little VOC um, reader for $75. It got really great um, uh, um, reviews from the experts. Maybe the library could get a hold of that. I'll just send you the info so you can look into it. It would be great to add to the library's collection. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Polly, and then we're going to move, I think we're going to need to move on to the next, uh, next uh, item. 
Uh, yeah, I was going to point out the library um, radon detector, although, <clears throat> you know, you have to use that for a while. And I believe the one at the library is the two-week meter. And if yeah. you get it, and of course, detecting radon depends upon the season and many, many other things. But about a good proportion of uh, all Colorado homes, something like 35 or 40 percent have radon uh, in substantial doses. I just got my house mitigated. Um, <laughs> but the, the one you want to get probably is the long-term one that you have out for six months. That will give you a better reading, uh, much better reading. Um, we also have Energy Smart, and they will do an energy audit and they will also test for different things, not just leaks and stuff like that, but they will also give you tests and advice. So we do have a lot of opportunities and we do look at uh, code upgrades every year, but remember every time we upgrade the code, it costs people more to build houses and then it costs people more to buy the houses and less people can afford to live here. So. There has to be a balance between uh, a code that is so uh, difficult that no one can um, fix their house or afford to live here. So. I'd rather see the city um, have tools um, available like at the library where folks yes. can do some self-assessment yeah. and maybe um, I know the city doesn't usually keep contractors on retainer, but some arrangement where building biologists can come in for less than a re the most ridiculous price, if there's any way the city could facilitate that. Well, you might talk to uh, the people at Energy Smart. That's a county program, so. Okay, thanks, Molly. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Francie. I think we're gonna have to move on to uh, uh, our next general business item, which is Adara Newsrat, who's going to be talking about sustainability tax. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're a little soft. I'm a little soft. I'll speak a bit more loudly. Oh, that's that's perfect. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, pleased to be here. My name is Atara Nazrat. I'm the new Sustainability Grant and Program Coordinator. Been here as of April 2020. Uh, you can go to the next slide. That's me. So I'm on a steep learning curve. But I'm happy to present and to learn here. So I'm going to be giving you an overview of the sustainability tax, which I believe this board um, approved for last year, the programs that we have running currently. And we are seeking your input for programs that we want to put forward for funding for 2021. Next slide. Okay, so first of all, we are currently funding five projects in 2020. We received $125,000 from Boulder County and provided a 25% match. The two first line items, the grant coordinator and the residential program coordinator were combined into one position and I'm currently occupying that position. Um, the following was the carbon free transportation roadmap, which Francie alluded to. Um, I believe we just received the draft report from the consultants, which is a hundred plus page report. Um, the WIC farmers market, the Women, Infant and Children's Farmers Market has received $10,000 and I believe they've expended that um, funding. Um, we have received the report and they said that they served 486 families through their curbside pickup program, including over 700 children and a further 150 families through their on-street market in Longmont, which opened up after May 30th. They also reported that farmers have seen over $23,000 in sales as a result of this program. Um, the Neighborhood Impact Granting Program, that was launched this summer as well. Um, it is also synonymous with the Sustainable Neighborhood Solutions Initiative, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But, but this program is effectively distributes funding to community-based projects initiated by, at the local neighborhood level for sustainability programs to make improvements locally, and it's a, it's a new partnership with the with the city and we provided $32,000 cash match against all of these programs. So next slide, please. So moving forward to 2021, um, as you all know, the climate emergency resolution in October kicked off the whole climate action task force 
and the report that was generated. And these are the recommendations summarized from that report, the 27, uh, distributed across six main categories. So as we think about what kind of sustainability tax funds we want to, to use in our projects going forward, we want to make sure that they are in alignment with whatever the city chooses to pursue in relationship to these recommendations. And as mentioned earlier in the presentation, Annie Noble is going to be presenting um, on August 25th, next Tuesday, and I believe the count, city council will be voting on these recommendations. So whatever the outcome of that meeting is and going forward will be a framing context for us in terms of considering what kind of priorities, gaps, needs we want to put forward for funding for the sustainability tax for next year. So next slide. So these are the framing um, conditions for 2021. So as I just mentioned, the sustainability, the, the city focus on climate action and how they will move forward, what direction they will take, will influence what we want to pursue. There's a possible reduction in funding from Boulder County. I did speak with a Boulder County staff recently and they are aiming to provide the same um, amount. So we received 125,000 in 2020. So I think we can safely assume that we'll receive somewhere between 115 dollars to $125,000 for next year, probably closer to the full amount because um, I think that's what they had originally aimed to do. So with that money, we want to meet some of the existing commitments. So the grant and program coordinator position was um, budgeted for two years. So that's $50,000 from the grant funding money that needs to be allocated there. And the neighborhood impact granting program. Um, there are a number of factors that will influence how much funding will be available for that for next year. Some of that will relate to um, funds distributed this year and how much may be able to get rolled forward. So that's a, an unknown. But uh, essentially that leaves us with between $65,000 and $75,000 to consider for projects for 2021. Next slide, please. So what we want to do with you is to identify gaps and needs to prioritize we have some suggestions that are um, based on what we have identified as a team, the sustainability team. And alongside the city's priorities and lens, we also want to ensure that we bring um, the following lenses to the projects that we identify. So we want to ensure our projects strengthen equity, accessibility, support immediate needs and impact from COVID. So that's an extra layer of criteria that we want to apply um, to the programs we want to fund. And these are the um, four different topic areas that we're considering, community engagement, adaptation, resilience, expansion of existing programs and workforce development. And um, you'll see that these map against the six uh, categories that the Climate Action Task Force also recommended. So next slide, please. So I'll go through each one of these areas in turn. So for community engagement, um, our manager, who you'll be very familiar with, Lisa Noblock, um, she had identified um, gaps in our own capacity as a team for the sustainability team. And to meet um, the objectives for um, addressing climate impacts in an equitable fashion, we feel that there is a need for a community engagement and equity specialist. So they would be supporting sustainability and climate action implementation. This position could be either part-time or full-time. And especially in light of COVID, where we can't reach as many people at the moment, and we certainly can't reach people in ways that they would like to be reached potentially. Um, this is actually very timely. And um, in order to actually pr produce outcomes which demonstrate equity, we need somebody to be able to be in that position to reach underrepresented communities. So this is one of the needs that we've identified. The second one. Uh, adaptation and resilience. Um, we want to be able to map the vulnerability and um, risk uh, across Longmont to communities. So we want to be able to understand the um, climate impact and, and the risks by, geogra by a geographical area and overlay the demographics over that data. So we would need to see well, where are the heat islands and how are people being affected what kind of needs do the community have to address these impacts? 
and um, identify potential recommendations. So if you could go, um, oh, the last bullet point, I'm not very familiar with this, but it may be more familiar to you all because this was discussed last year, a low income tree program. Um, I believe it was Brett and Natalie, uh, board members that may have raised this program last year. Uh, so this would be a potential option to explore in relationship to this. So if you could go to the next slide. This is a climate vulnerability map at the state level. And uh, some of you may be familiar with this kind of um, software. So you have overlays where you can select a climate hazard, whether that be drought, flood, wildfire, or all of them. Um, the climate scenario, whether we're looking at current climate, moderate um, deterioration of the climate or a severe deterioration of the climate. And then a population scenario where you're looking at the current population or a slight, ingree, slight growth or moderate growth or high growth. So those are just examples of overlays that you can actually perform with these kind of vulnerability maps. But what we're interested in is, well, this is very well at the state level, but we want to be able to see it at the city level and the neighborhood level. And there, there is software available to be able to do that, which will be very useful for us to then actually help plan projects that address climate vulnerability and the community needs. So this is something that we're particularly interested in. Um, there is a possibility that we might be able to apply to GOCO, the Great Outdoors Colorado funding initiative um, in the fall for this um, particular project, um, or we could supplement it if we um, have more funds, obviously. The next one, um, our third option identified is expanding existing programs. So I'm sure some of you will be familiar with uh, CARE, the Low Income Energy Efficiency Program by um, I forget the terminology, I think it's Outreach Colorado. Uh, and I know there's another program called CARES by Longmont, but um, the, these are slightly different. So this is the Home Upgrades Program. I believe this is currently on hold because of COVID, so people aren't going into people's homes. Um, SOL is a Sustainable Opportunities Lifestyle and Leadership Program. That has been launched this summer. And um, it is similar to CARE, but it goes further in helping Longmont residents identify cost-saving initiatives across energy, water, and other sustainable behavior um, areas, and also connecting people with some of the services available both in the city, such as efficiency works, um, such as the, the radon um, testers that you mentioned in, um, in the, the library. And we will also be providing upgrades. So I believe one of the upgrades is a radon self um, testing kit where the resident can then mail the kit afterwards once the actual um, self-assessment is done. So that's one of the things we're actually thinking of providing with, with our visits. Um, and in addition to that, we want to support people in just becoming more familiar with what kind of sustainable behaviors they may already be pursuing that they may not term sustainable, but they actually are. And so we want to empower people in that way. And then also um, connecting them with city services. Um, I'm involved with that program, so I can say a little bit more about it. And then the Sustainable Neighborhood Solutions Program I mentioned earlier, it's synonymous with the Neighborhood Impact Granting Program, where neighborhood groups can apply for funding for sustainable programs in their local area and partner with the city. So for all of these programs, we would need to confirm staff capacity, but uh, we feel that these are important programs that we obviously want to continue. The next slide. Workforce development. Again, this was identified in the Climate Action Task Force report, and I believe uh, the board supported the generation of a, a green workforce. Um, the idea would be to support climate action related to uh, workforce needs. But given the uncertainty right now of which direction the city may take, uh, we may want to wait until the next cycle when there's more information available about what the priorities will be from the city and what we can do to support that. Um, but that's still um, an important option, uh, especially in light of COVID-19, um, where the economy is obviously hitting people and people need support in, in relationship to um, work. So can we go to the next slide, please? So in terms of what we're asking of the board today is to brainstorm some of these ideas that we put forward. Um, we would take back your input to the city council leadership leadership to ensure that it aligns with the city's plans and priorities. 
Um, after that, we will report back to you on the next sustainability advisory, sustainability, sustainable advisory board meeting in October. Um, potentially for your approval and offer letter for support. And then we'll submit that in between September 14th and October 23rd. And once we have funding, then we'll take the IDA to the council for final approval. So that's the process going forward. So at this point, we've received input from the sustainability, for the Longmont Sustainability Coalition, and we're seeking your input. And then we will take that to council and move it forward from there. So if you could go to the next slide. I'm just summarizing the four different areas that I went through. So the community engagement and equity specialist to address climate impact in an equitable fashion and conduct outreach. Uh, the climate vulnerability risk mapping project, uh, which will really allow us to zone in on climate risks and impacts in Longmont at a city level and neighborhood level, and identify priorities for community needs. Uh, expanding the existing programs that we have, the care program, the SOL program, and the sustainable neighborhoods solutions program and then workforce development as recommended by the Climate Action Task Force. So those are the four areas. And of course, we welcome suggestions that are not included there, which you feel that we should be considering and prioritizing in addition. So I'm, um, I, I, I take it to, uh, to the board to discuss how to move forward with this. If you want to discuss all four items now, um, ideally it would be wonderful if we could prioritize the items that I mentioned and any additional ones that you would like to consider, and then we'll be able to take that forward to council. So um, that's the end of my okay. presentation. <laughs> Great, uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, I, guess, I guess I'd like to ask the rest of the board about how we would feel most comfortable proceeding given we technically have 12 minutes left of this meeting. <laughs> and, uh, and I know that for some of us, uh, some of these are rather expansive. Um, and we could probably have a lot of uh, things to share. So I guess I'd just like to ask uh, the rest of the board members what kind of level we would feel comfortable with engaging with this right now uh, before we, we have one more item on the, on the uh, uh, to, and I'm not sure how long it's gonna be, but we have one more item, but I just wanna make sure that people feel comfortable with the amount of time and thought that they have. Molly? Um. I um, I'm not sure whether we can legally do this because of the Sunshine Law, but perhaps we could all have a um, an online discussion of uh, I'm pretty sure we can't do this, but <laughs> of suggestions that we would like to see brought forward for this um, since this is coming up, uh, the sustainability tax discussion is coming up. Um, because I think it is timely right now, um, but uh, that's my suggestion that we we just offer what our preferences would be. Um, I I don't understand, um, and forgive me for not having done this research myself, but I don't understand the status of the sustainability tax period. Um, you know, when was it initiated? Okay. Um, what's the level of it? What is it currently being used to fund? And I don't think we can possibly okay. do justice to this in 12 minutes or no. whatever it's going to take. Um, I don't want to, um, I, I don't think it would be at all fair to Atara for her fine work to try to cram it in. Yeah. Um, is there anything that we can do in terms of the Sunshine Law, in terms of a, a writ, um, a forum discussion where all comments are written and then that becomes part of public record? Is that something the city has ever considered as an additional sort of addendum to this meeting? So something that you all could do is decide, um, vote to have somebody make a motion and a second and then a vote to hold a special meeting that would be noticed to the public and where they would be invited to attend as well. But that would um, allow us to have extra um, discussion time we would just need to let people know, we would need to know us specifically what that meeting would be for, since it would be a special meeting, you could only talk about the discussion items that are proposed on that agenda. Okay, um, since we're still in discussion, nobody has proposed this yet. Um, I um, don't want to dishonor the many, um, I want to honor 
the many community members and larger community members who uh, presented their um, public invited to be heard comments. And since uh, smart metering is part of um, the uh, discussion on the um, on the sustainability tax, perhaps that's one of the issues that we could bring up in the special meeting to talk about. I, I don't know. Just so wondering. Mary, that's not actually part of our agenda for today and public invited to be heard comments are just received by the committee. And then um, that's really all that is done with it. If the board decided later on to talk about that topic at a separate meeting, then that would be something that would need to be discussed for the work plan. So um, could I just clarify if we did uh, want to have a second meeting just specifically to, to discuss the sustainability tax, what is the timeline again where it would be useful for us to do that? Um, it would need to be fairly soon because the application window is between September 14th and October 23rd and it needs to go to council for review prior to submission of application. Okay, but it's not like uh, we have to do it by next week. I don't think so. No, think Polly, po Polly looks like maybe next week. <laughs> <laughs> Annie might be able to comment. Annie, do you have a sense of the best timeline for that? I'm concerned that we just heard this, con this presentation and if we wait X number of months, we just have to hear the presentation again. And, um, but then again, we're also sort of in the August doldrums. So do we really want to add this to a schedule when people are on vacation and so forth? Sorry, Annie, you were going to speak. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I will be presenting the Climate Action Task Force recommendations to council on August 25th, which is next Tuesday. And that might help provide some context for this board on what the council priorities are. Okay. Um, I guess, sorry, people drag racing down my street. Um, yep. I guess, uh, I guess, I mean, I guess an idea then is that I, I agree, I don't want to wait too long to discuss this, but perhaps um, I feel that I would need more than the time. I know I've wasted a lot of time discussing this, but I feel like I'd need more time than we really realistically have now to digest and think about it. So, um, I don't necessarily need to be the one to move to do it, but I would prefer perhaps that we schedule a, a dedicated um, uh, separate meeting outside of our normal. Since we missed a couple, we'll still be on average for 12 for the year. So we can maybe uh, uh, schedule a separate one once we've had, geez, once we've had time to, to digest this a little bit more. Can I ask a quick question on how much time do you need for public notice of a meeting? Oh, great question. We have to have 72 hours. Oh, okay. That's pretty quick. <laughs> so, or is it 24, Polly? That's 48. <laughs> <laughs> 72 is reasonable for the public, though. I prefer that we do that just out of courtesy. Usually what I okay. do for our meetings on Wednesday is I post it the uh, Friday before, so we have plenty of notice. But I think technically it's 24 hours. Okay, um, our, our next official meeting is on uh, September 16th. So um, I would, uh, I'll throw it out as an idea that the first week of September, which the first is on a Tuesday, the fourth is on a Friday, that we uh, try to schedule a, a meeting for that week. Would that, before I move to do it and get shot down, would that, uh, would that be reasonable when people hunt me down? Um, second, second your motion. Oh, okay. I didn't move. I will move now. I will move that we, re that we have, uh, that we create a, an additional meeting during the first week of September to discuss the sustainability tax. Um, and just that, because I know everybody's busy and we don't want it to get too expansive. And in that meeting, uh, we will there be able to have, uh, to learn what the council's priorities are because Annie will be presenting with them next week. So we'll have time to do that. We'll have time to digest the information, but not so much that we forget the entire discussion. And so voting. Mary, will you still second? Will you still second I'm that seconding. motion? Seconding. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. It's unanimous. And now we just have to make Heather do all the work to so Annie has a comment. Oh yeah, Annie. I'm sorry. I'm waiting to be acknowledged. Sorry. Um, no, I that's just okay. Wanted to say that it might be helpful if we send you a copy of the council communication 
yeah, we sent out that, last year that kind of describes the whole history of, of, that kind of, of the wonderful. Of the sustainability yeah. tax as that would be wonderful prior to that, that meeting. And it would be helpful if you could read that. <laughs> yes, yes, that would be that would be wonderful. Thank you, Annie. Mm -hmm. Also, for one one note of um, clarification for that meeting is Wednesday mm -hmm. a good day for you guys at three thirty. It's Can fine with know? me. Yeah, it's fine with me. Cody, Adam, okay. Sweet. Thank you so much. All right. Um, well, then, uh, if uh, thank you, Adara. Uh, appreciate that, and we'll see you in a few weeks, I guess. <laughs> uh, um, so the final issue, the uh, final uh, general business item that we have is a Button Rock Preserve Management Plan update with Danielle Levine. Um, so Danielle. Um, okay, well, I just wanted to um, touch base with Sustainability Board and uh, let you know where we are with the Button Rock Management Plan process. Um, we, we are nearing the end of this two-year project, and um, in part of our public outreach has been staying in touch with the Sustainability Board, the Parks and Rec Advisory Board, and the Water Board. And so this week and last, I've been meeting with advisory boards to give you the results of our third public survey. Um, so just to uh, remind you where we are, uh, we started this project in February 2019, and it and it's to look at Button Rock Preserve and gather baseline data and get a sense of what what condition the natural resources are in, what's going on in terms of visitor use, and so this is going to be. Uh, a management plan looking at all those items. Um, our first public meeting was in June 2019 and then our second public meeting was November 2019 where we heard um, summaries of what was gathered in terms of natural resources in the field, the data that was gathered. Uh, and then we hope to have a third public meeting in October of this year. It's gonna look a little different. It'll probably be online. Um, so that is still being worked out. The other public outreach that we have done is we've done we've conducted three public surveys, um, and so our third one was ran through May through August. And um, instead of being able to have it both at the trailhead and online, we we only had it online, but we had um, good turnout for the survey. We had 831 respondents, um, and that's compared to 1,000 some respondents for our second public survey when we were able to use multiple methods to reach people. So, so I'm here today to just go through the results of the public survey and answer any questions that you might have. So first of all, um, none of the questions are required. So not all of the uh, respondents answered every question. So to question one, where are you from? 160 people skipped it, but of those that answered, 74% were from Longmont. Question two, to alleviate parking at the preserve, would you ride a shuttle? 72% no, 28% yes. Three, the goals of Button Rock are to one, protect our drinking water supply, two, protect surrounding ecosystems, including healthy forests, three, provide sustainable recreational opportunities, Research indicates that when humans are accompanied by dogs, both on and off trail, their area of influence, noise, scent, trash, increases significantly, impacting wildlife behavior and movement. How would you feel if a no dog policy was instituted? Um, only two people skipped this question. 64% of those responding uh, strongly disagreed with a no dog policy. 25% strongly agreed with it. 11% felt neutral. Question four, beginning in 2021, staff recommends eliminating the Button Rock fishing permit and fee. Once in effect, anglers will only need to carry a state license instead of both a Button Rock permit and a state license. Do you agree with this recommendation? Again, only two people skipped this and 48% strongly disagree with getting rid of the Button Rock permit. 30 are neutral and 22 strongly agree with getting rid of it. Five, visitation is overwhelming the preserve, parking lot, restrooms, staff, trails, Staff recommends dispersing use and limiting overall visitor numbers, cars, people, dogs, by charging a fee on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays between Memorial Day and Labor Day. Do you agree with this strategy? 
55% yes, 28% maybe, 17% no. And then you'll see... Um, Sorry, do we have a second page of the... Yeah, yeah thank you. so check, check out that little chart there that's got the green and the orange. This is how it was presented, the options. Um, so so it, these are redundant options, you know, but it gets a sense of who residents are and what they might want in terms of their demographic or their preferences. So the first option was a, a daily pass, pay per time you go. 35% would, would choose the daily pass. 26% would choose an annual pass, pay annually. Um, and, and those are the prices there split out by utility customer and non-customer. And then another 27% for the annual pass who would be in the senior or disabled category. And then 12% doesn't support doing this and um, dispersing or limiting visitors in this way. And then um, these are still being compiled, so I can't get into the specifics of some of the comments that people mentioned, but um, this is just a summary of, there were, the people who commented, there were 131 written responses. Most people were talking about dogs, then hiking, fees, parking, trails, fishing, cars, and bikes. And so now I open it up to you for questions. Molly. So um, last year, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> or several years ago, uh, the ranger came and spoke to us and he was cleaning up 250 pounds of dog poop every day. And so we limited, I mean, this is just ridiculous, but if he hadn't said that, how would we know, you know? This is the effect that people have, I mean, that dogs have, and you know, it's, we all, we all love dogs, but. Um, <laughs> so we eliminated all but one dog, I believe. So now we're talking about eliminating all dogs. Is that an idea? Yes. I'm not sure that that survey together. Yeah. Response. Okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. If I remember correctly, the the ranger talked about how a lot of people who ran like dog walking services would take yes a dozen dogs up there with them and not clean up and that yeah. yeah. And, and they they were running free so that yeah they're <laughs> chasing down the deer and the, every you know it's just yeah so the rule yeah. that you um adopted the temporary rule while this management plan was going on was right. to put in place one dog per person on a leash right. with a pickup bag so that's yeah. what's been going on since may of 2019 and has that had a good effect uh, yeah, anecdotally from the temporary ranger that we have up there now, yes, that's had a good effect. And most people are are obeying that that um, interim rule. Um, there's only a few offenders, repeat offenders, yeah. um, in, in terms of especially people letting their dogs off leash in the meadow area. Yeah. Um, and we're seeing this from wildlife camera footage. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. But, you know, people get very riled up about their dogs. It's like we, it's the same as if we had a no child rule. <laughs> to them, you know, it really is. To them, it, it's, this is their buddy and they want to take a walk with their buddy. And I, I get that, but your buddy causes a lot of problems too. So I am very, very glad though that we did institute uh, just one dog because yes, I, I've seen that too. You've got somebody with six dogs. There were lots of people like that and that's just crazy, so. Mary? Um, yes, I, uh, I wanna weigh in about the fishing license. Um, what is the impact of that? Do we need the extra funds? Is it worth it to the, ha the extra hassle and the small amount of money that we get from each um, a resident who applies for it, can we just kind of get rid of that in the spirit of being yeah. more generous to our community members? So um, about the fishing license, this survey um, was designed to be on a postcard at the trailhead. So not all details could be captured in these questions and I didn't want to write story questions. Sure. But, but the, the, the problem here is that it doesn't capture all the information. Um, so the, the money that is collected from these fishing licenses 
doesn't actually go back into Button Rock. That's one point. Oh. The, the, the second point is that um, when, when we had uh, one ranger up there, it, it, is a, it is a big administrative duty to um, deal with these permits and go and collect them and deal with the money and, and work the whole program all year long on top of other ranger yeah. duties when we're short staffed. So that was another. But the, a huge reason for this um, idea of eliminating the permits is because CPW would like to stock, uh, stock the reservoirs and the creek and will will do so more and create um, more f recreational fishing if we do go ahead and eliminate this this permit. Mm -hmm. So and for those reasons, so for those reasons, staff was suggesting eliminating it. And then the final point is that in in all the years leading up to now, we hadn't been selling out of the permits, right? So like they weren't, yeah, they weren't limiting users and only those users were fishing and we were um helping control angler population we weren't selling out of them this year um covid has been a bit of an exception um but it, those are all the reasons behind this question and this suggestion from staff okay so i, I mean i don't we're not are we taking any formal votes i recommend that we say get rid of that um, and um, that we get rid of it. Can we just, I, can I make a motion? So I that was my, that was my question. Actually, sorry, Mary, that was my question actually. Is that is there something that as a board we need to thumb up, thumb down, or even give an official recommendation for? Not, um, not at, not at this time. I'm here to inform you. I do mm -hmm. want to um, let you know that we'll be back in front of the boards and council with a draft document and some of these these decision points more formalized. Mm -hmm. This survey um, was meant to put out to the public and get what are probably some of the most contentious visitor issues, some of the most controversial ones out there and, and gather the data and, and, and let you know about it. And then we're gonna come back and um, do this again. And so then, yes, we'd like to get a recommendation from this board on various points, but not at this meeting. Okay. And I have one more question. Um, there's a really big difference between the one dog people and the six dog professional walker people. And um, I know this has come up in other places. I cannot remember where, but uh, the two dog people are, they seem to be, uh, I live um, right um, near um, um, one of our fine little parks. And there seems to be as many two dog walkers on leashes as there are one dog walkers and I'm wondering if making an exception because there are so many people that just really want to be able to bring their whole family which is two dogs I'm wondering what percentage of the local dog owners are two dog owners and if that actually would make that much of a difference in terms of the mess if we changed it that much I don't have that answer but I would like to um, point out in question three if we can pull that up again I'd like to point out to this board um, just that when we're talking about these visitor use issues at Button Rock, um, they, are, they are contained in um, the, third, the third goal for the preserve. So number one in big, big bold letters is to protect our drinking water supply and protect that local watershed. And, and, and number two goal for the Button Rock Preserve and why it's a preserve and why we call it a preserve is to protect the surrounding ecosystems, including healthy forests uh, that also protects our, our water supply. And then way down third, third reason for the preserve and, and, and something that we offer to our public is passive recreational opportunities at the preserve. And so um, I just, this context is important to keep in mind when we're looking at all of these issues. Great. Well, thank you very much, Danielle. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Adam? Yeah, thanks, yes. Danielle. One question I had is regarding a potential bias in the survey. I'm concerned that regarding the shuttle usage, that might uh, be looked uh, upon not so favorably, given that that was right after COVID or during COVID. And so people are probably not so inclined to want to take any sort of public transportation. That's a good point. Um, this survey was written and designed before the pandemic. 
Um, but you're right. Um, we don't have Great any point. plans to develop a shuttle system in the near future. It's costly. It, it's got a lot of things uh, associated with it. However, we did want to take the opportunity during this management plan process to collect this data. But yes, now we need to put an asterisk by it and say, people were a answering this question during the summer of the pandemic. That's yeah. a good point. That's a very good point. Are there any other questions? Uh, for Danielle. Okay, thank you very much, Danielle. Um, we were now on to uh, other business, which doesn't thank have you. any subheadings. Uh, thank you, Danielle. <laughs> um, we're now on to other business, which has no subheadings. Um, I have two quite I have two comments on other business. Um, I think uh, so. We're items from the board. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, that'll be that'll be in a in two <laughs> sorry um i don't know who other business is necessarily from actually but um we don't have any other business currently. we don't have any other business okay so we do have two items from staff so uh, just the first one is the um pharmaceutical take back event is october 24th and this is really just an informational item that that event actually is going to be at longmont united hospital this happens every year um, to help keep the pharmaceuticals out of our um, treated water system and stuff like that. Um, so um, they are actually going to do a car drop off event this year instead of taking it into the building due to the pandemic. Uh, they're just going to have you drop it off at the Longmont United Hospital from your car. So, And then right. the other one, the additional information and correspondence um, were attachments that were included in your packet for today's meeting. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, items from board. I know Mary would have an item from the board. Would you like to? I'll just say some uh, very mm -hmm. quickly. What is our plan for revisiting the um, the climate action plan? I um, I I I think that the um, it would be much stronger if there if it was more research based. That was one of my comments in our in the um, as we went through it last month. And um, I think it would be great for the folks who have just joined the board to be able to look at it as well. Um, and the second item, I guess, is related to this because when Polly brought up it was related. Um, is there still a plan to make this board a commission? And if we were a commission, would that make us responsible for some of these plans in terms of having them live with us and be a, a home? I think that Maybe that's three different issues, but um, having been on the board for a year, I would like to I would like to clarify the the second two as well. Annie, it looks like you had some. Uh... Um, yeah, so I just um, I guess wanted to let you know what my intentions are as far as presenting to council. Um, so um, the council communication should be out, and you should have it available. I think. Um, you know, it's publicly available. And so you could see how I describe the Climate Action Task Force. And I have proposed next steps in that council communication that I'll be presenting to council on Tuesday night. So um, what my hope is that um, on Tuesday, when I go through the board comments with council, um, that the council feels ready to take a look at all the recommendations of the Climate Action Task Force and um, either accept the recommendations, reject the recommendations, or request further analysis on some of the recommendations. And then um, our proposed next step is to take the recommendations that Council has accepted and do an analysis of those recommendations. So look at the cost impacts, the greenhouse gas reduction potential, staff it, you know, resources needed and kind of do a, a further analysis of all the Climate Action Task Force recommendations that Council has approved and, and bring that back to Council at some point in time um, with a pro proposed prioritization. And certainly there's opportunity for the Sustainability Advisory Board to weigh in um, as we do that process. But I just wanted you to understand what I'm proposing to Council, don't know what Council motion is going to be or how they're going to view it but essentially what we wanted is for council to take a look at all the recommendations recommendations and decide which ones they want to move forward with 
and some might require further analysis. Like some might be rejected. Some they might say, look at them all, evaluate them, see what the cost impacts are, see what you know the greenhouse gas Im impacts are, so that you know then we could kind of have a better understanding of what what level of effort it's going to take to kind of weave these into different city work plans. So I don't know if that makes sense, but um, I think there is opportunity. Okay, so it sounds that some of it is going to come back to us. Um, so the second part of my question was to follow up on what Polly had to say about this um, board becoming a commission. And if so, if that would change our responsibility for having a more formal uh, sort of pass or um, authorization, you know, authority over um, the life cycle of these plants, these various plants that come through it. Is Polly still with us? Yes. Yeah, that, uh, just as you had to um, ask city council to change your name uh, and city council approved that and you, you had to ask city council to get rid of their prohibition on you discussing anything that council hadn't given you permission to discuss, which was previously the case uh, 10 years ago or uh, seven years ago, um, uh, you would have to ask for this to become a commission and you'd have to make a case for that. And uh, uh, to me, the climate action plan um, is a case for that. And having uh, a much hardier um, sustainability plan, a much hardier sustainability department, all of which Lisa and Francie and everybody in, and Annie have all been working on um, is a good argument for that. But that, that's something that this board has to decide upon and build an argument for. So, and I think okay, that's I would a good like idea. To, I would like to propose that we put that on the agenda for um, the next, uh, can I make a motion that we put that on the agenda to, to discuss in our next meeting? Uh, I believe. Heather? I believe you can make a motion to put it on a future agenda. Okay. I'm going to make a motion that we put that on a future agenda. I will second that motion. So. So all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Sweet. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, Polly, we will go back to you one more time if there are any items from council. Uh, well, I think there'll be a lot of things coming up that we'll be <laughs> okay, fairly great. discussing like next week we'll see Annie and um, so that'll be really interesting. I'm going to suggest to the city council that they actually watch this meeting because we, we really had a, a very extensive discussion on many, many things that are, um, that we've acted on like button rock and yet you know, these are, this is something that city council needs to, I think, take the time to educate themselves on. And now that um, uh, Longmont Public Media is filming everything and recording everything, there's really no excuse for them not to make an effort to educate themselves on some of the issues that are going up at some of these meetings. It, it, but it, of course, it takes... <laughs> A huge amount of time. I mean, I'm already on, I don't know, five or six boards. And then if I try to watch all the other boards that everybody else is on, it's uh, yeah, impossible. But, you know, that's our job. Well, you <laughs> so, get paid the big bucks, Polly. Yeah, that's right. $8,000 <laughs> a year for 80 hours a month. Anyway. Big four figures. Well, thanks for yeah. your stewarding of this meeting, Polly. But, um, okay. I do think that, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see any, any, uh, a lot of what we're doing right now has to do with, uh, is concerned with COVID. And just to remind everybody who doesn't know, this council gave emergency uh, powers to the uh, city manager who runs the city anyway, you know, the council does not really run the city. The city manager runs the city with the city attorney and the, and the, the uh, judge um, who we hire. But um, so 
lots of COVID stuff going on, and but we're doing well. So that's really important because none of this will improve until we get COVID under better control. But Boulder County is doing very well. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I believe that brings us to a, uh, I will move to adjourn the meeting. Second. All in favor of adjourning. Aye. Aye. Awesome. I realized just as an aside, we forgot to have Adam and Charles uh, introduce themselves. So that's how we'll start next meeting. If that's oh, okay. and can Charles introduce his auxiliary board member, the black fluffy one? <laughs> yes. So at the start of next meeting, uh, we'll make sure that we actually do proper introductions. I apologize for that. Great. Thank okay. you, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.